Welcome everyone. I'm super excited to have Anton Howes with me today. Anton Howes is an innovation historian and policy thinker. He's written a brilliant history of the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. It's arguably Britain's national improvement agency over the last 260 years. Uh, and he is the RSA's historian in residence. I recommend you check out his book, Arts and Minds. It's a great read. He writes a Substack newsletter blog also on ideas of innovation thinking, and that's won an award from Tyler Cowen's Emergent Ventures. Uh, he has a day job as head of innovation research at the Entrepreneurs Network Think Tank, and in my mind is an excellent all-round thinker on innovation. Anton, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Great, so let's go straight in. So productivity and innovation. When you think about value and welfare and maybe items that are not easily recorded in economic measurements, do you think the decline in productivity or this period of possible innovation stagnation that some people have argued for recently has been perhaps somewhat overstated or not? And do you think we're entering another era perhaps now of en enhanced invention and innovation? Yes, so I, I, I tend to take the view that it's, if it has been overstated, um, it's in perhaps particular realms or particular industries. Uh, my view is that there's actually probably more innovation than ever, that the acceleration of invention has only accelerated all the more to the extent that what in the past would have been considered quite groundbreaking stuff nowadays seems, you know, boring. You know, the, the a ten percent improvement in in in, the, in textile industries doesn't have quite the impact that a ten percent improvement in, tech, in the textile industries would have had two hundred three hundred years ago. Um, we see ever more diversity in products. We saw we see ever more changes to logistics, to transport infrastructure, to the kinds of foods that we can eat, to the kinds of experiences that we can purchase. You know, the, what we can do with our leisure time in constant changes to the quality of the kinds of goods that we use, the materials that we use for them. Um, and it's become so common for us to get, you know, we're, we're so used to those sorts of changes that I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that we've had um, any kind of particular stagnation. Now, where I can, where I can kind of concede a point is that perhaps in the really big headline type stuff, the sort of things, for example, that Robert Gordon might point to, Maybe there have been slowdowns in particular realms or in particular, you know, the introduction of radically new household items, for example, that everyone's going to use. Perhaps there's been some kind of changes. But by and large, I think we've had um, a continued acceleration of invention. That said, and this is a point I, I make quite often, um, it's no bad thing to be worried about it. So even if, you know, even though I might disagree with people who think they're, um, that there's some kind of stagnation, it's... I can see it being a good thing to say that there is a stagnation because if we do get the, the technology of the future a little bit earlier than we would otherwise have done because of that concern, then that's also the good, right? I'd rather yeah. have the future faster um, than have the future now yeah. if that future is one of, of technological progress and continued improvement and so on. So a useful myth perhaps um, that I think is well worth um, promoting. And, and you know, to a, to a large degree, it's had a big impact in, in the, the creation of this sort of progress studies banner um, largely thanks to Tyler Cowan, Patrick Collison, you know, others have been working on this, or they've been kind of circling around this idea for a, for a long time. The big impact that's had, I think, has been as a sort of lightning rod, is that suddenly people who were already working on this sort of thing, but kind of circling around it or didn't have a name for it, have now got a banner under which to, to do those sorts of studies. And that's been useful. Yeah. And fast forward today, there's some evidence that um, they slightly changed their minds that actually a lot of innovation is, is happening, or rather we've seen it maybe in some fields like biomedical. That, your comment there leads me to think also around the difference between incremental innovations or things we kind of think, think of incremental and those more transformational ones, and maybe also specific versus general purpose. But, but maybe on the incremental versus sort of transformational, do I sense that maybe we underrate those five to 10% incremental innovations, the ones which might not even be worth a patent or something like that, but slowly improves over quality and is, is quite hard to measure? Yes, I think I think we generally do. We, we like to focus on the headline stuff, partly because it's sexier, you know, it's exciting new products that kind of come out of nowhere. You know, we, we think of 
the first big Apple, you know, showcase events with Steve Jobs standing in front of those people wowing everyone, you know, we think of these big launch events. Um, but the reality is that even if we look at those inventions or those innovations, when we boil it down to it, it's actually a collection of small improvements that have just been kept under wraps for a long time. We've allowed those improvements, marginal improvements to all accumulate to this, to this point where when we then reveal it, it appears as though it's magic. Um, and that's, I think, something throughout all of history as well. You know, I, I tend to, to say that the, the steam engine is another great example. If you look at the development of the steam engine, it's, it is a story drawn out over decades and decades, even centuries, of marginal improvements to its efficiency, marginal improvements to the ways in which it can be applied and so on, uh, marginal improvements to our understanding of how it works, that then over time result in this transformative technology. But there isn't any sing single inventor who kind of has the one big breakthrough. You know, even when we talk about that, we actually have to split the, uh, split the credit across a, a, a small number of people. When we actually start to look into the very details of their invention, we actually split the credit even further. Um, but even with any particular inventor in that regard, we have to then look at, okay, it's not necessarily that they had what some kind of um, annus mirabilis you know, the sort of thing that people think uh, when the pandemic started we a lot of people noticed that newton seemed to have in his plague year was, partic was particularly productive um that's not really the case yes he writes a lot during that year but it's actually still as a result of the accumulation of a lot of work that had been going on for years and years and years um so that's a kind of, that's i think what's happening there now, there's another thing worth mentioning which isn't just that it's uh, that marginal improvement is underrated um, and often not even measured, right? When we when we think of um, inflation statistics, for example, when we talk about real GDP, we're actually often discounting quality improvements because we're trying to equate the television of today to the television of yesteryear. If we actually you know, look compare the two side by side, they're obviously not the same. Um, so the money we're paying on, we're paying for these things. You know, Inflation statistics are supposed to look at a set basket of goods, but the basket of goods that we use has changed radically and has to be rebased every few years because of the change changes to the diversity of products that we purchase and to the quality of those products as well. Um, so I think that often we, we understate in our statistics just how much improvement's going on there. Um, but the other point I think is that each of the industries that we have, this is something I call the paradox of progress, each of the industries we have has become smaller as a proportion of the economy as a whole. So I mentioned textiles earlier, you know, textiles used to be massive. We're talking at least 15% of the economy in Britain in, in, the, in the 18th century. But today in the major textile exporter in the world, China, you know, it's, it's, it's less than half that. It's about six, 7% based on the kinds of estimates that I could find. Now that's a massive, massive industry today. And we're talking on aggregate, many more textiles being produced, you know, millions and possibly billions more textiles being produced each year, but as a proportion even of their economy, you know, it's, 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 it's shrunk. And so any improvement that you have to this smaller industry as a, you know, well, the industry itself is bigger, but smaller as a proportion of the whole industry is gonna have less of an impact on the, on the economy overall. But you know, if, 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 uh, if, if coffee were something like 50% of the British economy, then you know the arrival of Starbucks and all the the increased improvements from all the artisanal coffee makers would would put them on par with James Watt and John Kay and Richard and Richard Arkwright and Ada Lovelace or whoever you want to mention, right? Because of the impact that that would have had, but because it's become the smaller thing, and I think that's the paradox there is that through invention we actually create new subspecialisms out of previous specialisms. Textiles has gone from overwhelmingly in England, let's say, being wool to adding things like silk and linen and cotton. Um, and then you've got all of these newly invented artificial fabrics, the nylon and the various kind of polyesters and so on, right? That There's invention that's creating um, these improvements or creating that diversity. And as a result, any improvement to these sub new subfields, again, has a smaller apparent impact than than an older invention of a very comparable sort would have had before. That brings to mind two reflections. One is on your first point about people not understanding incremental innovation. I, and I'm sure we'll talk about this is because people don't actually, the person in the street doesn't have a very good idea about what innova innovators do, how innovation actually happens, you know, small teams, big teams, corporate and the like. So we'll come at that. So they missed the incremental because they don't know it, it's kind of happening. And then on your second point about essentially the, the challenges or the mismission of inflation, big TVs versus other TVs, 
Um, I felt this generally over welfare. So my example within healthcare is, is how we view pain. So now we have uh, ways of managing pain and, you know, talk about something extreme like, you know, terminal illness in your, in your last couple of weeks uh, of life. You can now spend those last couple of weeks pain free. Mm-hmm. I, and I don't exactly know what the value of that is, but I'm, I'm guessing it's pretty enormous uh, to you. You know, if you, if you could, particularly the last two weeks, you, could you exchange half your worldly value to, to be in your last month and to know your family is, is, is pain free? Um, you, you would maybe be making that decision. But because we have very cheap pain medications, which have been around all the time, that nowhere in our measurement do we say, well, what is the actual welfare value of, uh, of being pain free? Say, and that's one small example of where I think some of these general inventions or even that um, are quite hard to measure because actually the value to us is, is extraordinarily high, but, but not, in a, not, in a dollar, not in a dollar way. Yeah, or even on a societal level, I think medicines has a lot of really useful examples there, that there are all sorts of drugs that are being developed year after year after year, which are treating very, very specific diseases, which maybe a handful of people in the world suffer extraordinarily from. I mean, this is like debilitating stuff. It's the sort of thing that it gets narrow and narrow, but we've actually seen extraordinary improvements in the treatment of a lot of those, those diseases. But yes, just because they're for a few people, I don't think means that progress has, has slowed down. Maybe on the big stuff, you know, the, the cancer research and the Alzheimer's and so on that affect, you know, millions and millions of people worldwide, there have been slowdowns of some sort. And even then I'm actually skeptical because it seems as though there has been dramatic improvement in, in the treatment of even the headline diseases. Um, but the fact that we're having this incremental improvement that's still ongoing and actually sometimes even accelerating in these in these kind of smaller cases, um, that, that their smallness is only comparable to looking at society as a whole and thinking things in this kind yeah. of very meta way. So I look at healthcare quite a lot and I, I agree that actually healthcare biomedical progress is still happening at a reasonably fast clip, obviously quite hard to measure. There may be arguments about how much we're having to spend to get that progress, but then even there, I think it's a, it's a little bit unclear. Mm. So you have this idea or a vision for a, a kind of grand or great exhibition um, as a mechanism for people to understand invention and innovation uh, closer and maybe be inspired to invent and fix problems uh, for themselves, but almost as a direct mechanism. Uh, would you like to elaborate on why you think a great exhibition is, is such a good idea and actually maybe what you do if you're organizing one? Obviously the UK has got a kind of mini one maybe in the offing, but you know, how should we really think about the great exhibition, both in history and, and what we should do now? Yeah, so a lot of people think of the World's Fairs, and they'd be right in doing so, right? The World's Fairs, they, they camped the Great Exhibition of 1851, the famous one for its crystal part as being the first of its number. Not that there was this idea of World's Fairs coming out of it, it's just they, that was the first one, and they've kind of backdated the first of their number to that one. Um, the problem is that nowadays, World's Fairs, I think, have become very much national branding exercises. They're highly curated. You've got, you know, conference designers putting together exhibits that they think the public will like um, for a sort of mass market. You've got you've got country stalls, but the country stalls are going to be the sorts where, you know, Britain's trying to show off its particular things that it wants to show off at the time. I don't know, it's got buzzwords that some ad agency has come up with that it wants to promote. Um, various other you know countries will have certain cultural things they want to do. They're trying to get tourists along. They're trying to kind of it's it's a PR agency kind of um, I'm trying to think of the world there's kind of delight for PR, PR infomercial agencies, maybe. agencies. Yeah, kind of inf- grand infomercial. Now they get lots and lots of visitors and you know some of them are extremely popular, but that's not what the original exhibitions were. So the Great Exhibition of 1851 is copying the French model of the Industrial Exhibition, which is a highly commercial event in the sense that you have lots of businesses but also individuals and scientists and whoever else all over the country um, who are producing things. And these producers should have, be, have this opportunity to showcase the best of what they're doing. And by showcasing the best, you do two things. You allow producers to educate one another by sharing best practice. So if you are you know, a cotton manufacturer and you get to see what your rivals down in the south of the country and you're in the north of the country are doing, you're like, wow, this stuff is amazing. Here's what I need to catch up. Here are the inventions I need to adopt in order to 
you know, raise my game, then that's all to the good. So it becomes an engine of invention um, in that respect. Um, in another respect also, you've got the fact that by putting everyone in the same room or in the same building in, the, in just a, the space of a few months, you're potentially going to create all of these connections amongst people. You know, the Great Exhibition of 1851 happens to coincide, coincide and it's not coincidence at all with the first international chess tournament. You know, world level international one that they're trying to organize and likewise with all sorts of other initiatives for international standardization um you know you've you start to get the first proper conversations about standardizing things from um the postal service to telegraph rates to late with the later world's fairs including things like musical pitch you know which haven't been internationally standardized before so you've got that kind of those kinds of conversations that might spark further invention um, and then from the consumer point of view if you're just a ordinary visitor to these things, you might be exposed to products that you hadn't even realized you wanted, you know, in the same way that constantly happens through advertising today is that the, you know, often the main effect of advertising, I think, is just reminding you that you might want something already, um, or just exposing you to a product that you had no idea was there. And so they're highly commercial things, which I think nowadays a lot of government bodies will be uncomfortable with. Um, and perhaps explains even at the time why the Great Exhibition, despite the fact it has this Royal Commission that's set up to organize it, is still ultimately a private event. Um, it was a for-profit event. The profits are reinvested in the creation of um, what ends up being the kind of museum mile. Um, so, you know, think the Royal Albert Hall, the Albert Memorial, um, the, the Victorian Albert Museum, the Science Museum, all of the, this kind of cultural hub known at the time as Albertopolis after Prince Albert for being the kind of notional head of this, of this, this project. Um, but ultimately is a, is a, is a for-profit thing um, with these non-profit kinds of aims, um, very strangely organized, um, but also, you know, the funding doesn't come from government, it comes from subscriptions. So I think today you'd ha actually have to probably copy that model fairly closely because it probably has to be something that's crowdfunded to a certain degree, that has private capital going into it to a certain degree, that allows you to then do those quite commercial things like have people send in their exhibits and be able to use it as advertising and not get uncomfortable about, you know, tendering processes and, you know, fair treatment and so on um, from the use of that event. So I think often it's the, I think it's the sort of thing that requires some kind of government involvement. Certainly you're going to need permissions, you're going to need perhaps policing, you're going to need kind of insurance kinds of questions need to be sorted out. There are all sorts of things that need to be solved. Uh, but the way I like to think of it in modern terms is if you imagine some of the great big industry fairs that you see, often for specific industries, imagine all of those rolled into one super event. Um, so not just seeing the very latest in, I don't know, drones or software, but also the very latest in bathroom design or, you know, art in general or, or sculpture or pottery or building, you know, just absolutely everything that you can think of jammed into this um, super event. So the kinds of thing I'm envisaging um, would include, you know, if we do manage to genetically engineer dinosaurs and so on, those would be featured if we do manage to, um, so kind of, maybe this isn't the right thing to say because I'm kind of going to raise Jurassic Park kind of concerns, but, you know, if we, if we, whatever is the kind of next level of technology that we're just about to hit, it should be showcasing that Live robotics. for any, everyone to see. Or robotics, robotics yeah. yeah. Or you know, people, people moving don't things realize, with their brain. People don't realize that today people are like going around in mech suits lifting heavy objects in factories. This is happening already, and yet, you know, it's the sort of thing that is otherwise consigned to fiction. Like Iron Man kind of suits already sort of exist in some very, very specific uh, ways. Yes. Although I think to some of the other work you've been doing it's sort of a, a, a bit of a false presumption that you've got this kind of rich Tony Stark, which is going to make an Iron Man suit in terms of in how invention actually happens. So I think it's a brilliant idea. I do think there's a touch of it, you know, there's a huge big tech uh, conference which happens in Spain every year. I don't know, you should probably, um, you might be fascinated to know when, it, when we do the real person in life thing again. Um, so Amazon on their AWS side have this big conference. And I, I went around to one of them. So this one's free. Um, you know, with this idea and thousands were there, but I did think, you know, but it was really just these people who were interested in Amazon tech. I thought, mm. and it's open to the general public, but it wasn't. And this is the problem about the fact that we've had advances in so many areas. You know, this is just the little pocket of Amazon world, like you say, where's, where's the medicine, where's the engineering, where's the networks effect, where's the mm. deep mind, where 
all of these. Um, I think it would be a great thing, although I, I wonder about the scale of it to really happen. We need to cross all of these things, but it would then show that actually we've made progress in so many of these different fields compared to where we were, that that's, that's part of it. Yeah, and I think there's the benchmarking, right? So with the, with the original in industrial exhibitions that are copied of the Great Exhibition. So in France, they start these off in 1798, and every few years they have a new event. Um, the idea at the time was that out of um, patent fees, they would be funded. Um, so the French ones were state funded ones um, from this particular accrual of fees. And then they would kind of hold an event every few years. And then you have this benchmarking process. You're able to see how much has this particular industry progressed in the country versus where it was before. And people start to get worried. I mean, the reason the Brits copy it is because they start to look at the levels of mechanization that are being achieved in France and starting to worry that France already has this lead in fashion, but if it also catches up to the lead that Britain has in, has in kind of uh, mass production of things, then from an international trade perspective, the competition is really coming and, and something needs to be done about it. So the idea behind having the international exhibition there was also to kind of reveal not just to celebrate British accomplishments, but actually to reveal shortcomings um, and is used as a tool by reformers to, to point to things that then need to be done by the government from a policy perspective. That's again, another very valuable thing about it, which is I think it can, you know, revealing who's ahead and who's behind along these certain metrics is I think often very valuable information that you just don't otherwise come by, right? Especially when it's in this kind of qualitative way um, you can do all of the quantitative studies you like, but ultimately seeing is believing, I think, especially for policymakers. Yeah, for certain. And I, that's one of the things I got from your book, um, Arts and Minds, was I hadn't appreciated in the early history of the RSA, and, and maybe, well, actually, it's, its whole history to, to um, you know, onto the modern day, this idea that there was um, a nation state element to it is like, we will, we will better the world as a sort of side effect, but we should definitely better our nation and then yes if what we do spills over to the rest of the world that's great but we need to ensure um you know british inventions or british things we don't fall behind and and therefore you know this is why we're going to gang together and, and do that so this kind of um what you might call it enlightened self-interest was seemingly quite um quite a large driver which which could kind of remain today and be be utilized mm. do you do you not think even in a globalized Kind of frame. I mean, I think I think there's actually a globalized justification for this kind of nationalism um, in in a, in a way in that if you have lots of countries or what, so Britain, you know, Boris Johnson said, oh, I want to, I want this country to be the best place in the world for scientists and inventors or something to that effect. I can't remember the exact words, um, but that's a useful thing to what every national leader to say, right? We we should be encouraging every national leader to do that because then we get a race to the top of the kinds of institutions, the kind of support that invention gets. Um, worldwide. So, you know, some people often say, why, but you know, given agglomeration effects, given that usually the real driving force happens in the places where people are most concentrated, surely we should just get everyone over to Silicon Valley or whatever is the latest version, I don't know, Miami or there's been lots of new ones lately, right? But to the Silicon Valley or Neo Silicon Valley, we should just get everyone there and have the kind of agglomeration effect from everyone being so concentrated. Um, but in actual fact, we want other countries to be the next place because that way, even if that particular hub starts to fail or starts to decay or starts to decline in some kind of way, then there's going to be a new place for them to step to. Sure. Um, and I so mean, that race to the top of it is... should be able to sustain at least one, if not more than one type of hub. It's kind of interesting that there's so few hubs of sort of Silicon Valley's nature. Yeah, I mean, I suspect globally. there are more hubs, but for more specific industries that yeah. we give credit to. I mean, think of Nokia and so on coming out of Finland. And I think there were particular industry hubs of certain ways. And Silicon Valley makes a big headline impact because of the fact that you've got, you've got these very, very successful companies making a lot of money and kind of attracts people to that as well. What role do you think um, innovation prizes uh, should play or not because I was also when you're reading your book I was sort of struck by how many essentially innovation prizes or all those type of things seem to be a, a, around and when I look at today that there are some but don't seem to be the the level and scale you know also adjusted of sort of the, the money and both prestige mm -hmm. available uh, versus that do, do you think we should be having maybe more innovation uh, prizes I guess it's gone down the world of VC and accelerators a different form of funding um, 
But I, I, I mean, I was intrigued by, by how many innovation prizes there seem to be about versus today. Or maybe well, I just... Today, it seems like there's, there's loads more. It's just that maybe there, there's a lot, or certainly a lot more money available via prizes. Mm -hmm. I don't know about prestige available via prizes. Yeah. And that's a slightly different thing. Um, now, certainly you've got, so we're not talking, I think, here for, for more kind of general listeners that about things like the Nobel Prize, which is sort of lifetime achievement prize, but more for a specific you know, longitude style prize. Here's yeah. a particular problem. Here's, here's the, yeah. if you find a solution, here's X amount How would of money. You, more think, environmentally friendly cement or... Right, so know. we've got the X prizes, Elon Musk has got his various prizes. I've seen all sorts of other particular ones. I think Prince William just announced a new prize with someone else, you know, for environmental purposes. Um, I actually remember at one point, even the RSA um, did a study on the number of environmental prizes saying there's too many and we need to start kind of okay. all right so i take it back there's not a problem it. with the number of prizes maybe it's the prestige associated yeah or that perhaps the money is too spread out along uh, yeah. between too many different prizes and that actually is not sufficiently motivating now the problem with prizes i think is that just like a lot of innovation policy in general it, it affects the direction of invention but i don't think it actually does much to increase invention as a whole mm -hmm. um so if we think of there being a kind of pool of inventors, you know, they have limited attention spans. There's only so many things that they're going to be working on at once. And what prizes do is they, just like any, you know, people follow the money, generally speaking. So if you have, if you attach pools of money to particular activities, they're going to direct themselves towards those sorts of things. Now that can be extremely useful. Um, one of the valuable things I think that the Society of Arts did was it often tried to um, have prizes that would be available to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to sources of funding. Um, so they might be people who are too poor for patents, they might be too gentlemanly to grubby themselves with commercial things, hence the kind of prestige elements, um, or they might be for prizes that aren't worth patenting because they're either too niche or they're not for profitable things. There might be safety improvements where the profit making isn't as obvious as a kind of um, line to them. Um, or they might use them to direct people's attention to the sorts of things that people were working on. So much more humanitarian kinds of um, things to do. So improvements to how to rescue someone from a river who's drowning, improvements to how to prevent carriages from overturning, improvements to how to you know, put brakes on steam engines, um, improvements to the lifeboat and so on and so forth. Um, or really, really, really niche stuff, which, you know, actually often does have this hidden humanitarian aspect to them, but isn't as obvious in hindsight, like um, improvements to carrying fish over land rather than sea so that you can break the monopoly of the Billingsgate fishmongers because there's this social concern that monopolists are taking advantage and raising prices of basic commodities and so on. So you have all of these, I think those are the particular uses of prizes that I think people should focus on when, when designing them is that they should be about directing people's attention to things that aren't already being done. Um, I think there's a lot of work on environmental stuff. I can see why they're environmentally um, focused prizes, um, but the more specific they are, the better. Um, so something like, I want a prize that's going to take carbon out of the atmosphere is much better than a general environmental prize, I think, nowadays, given the value it has at, at least getting existing inventors to, to, to look at particular problems. Um, but the other lacking thing is definitely prestige. Um, I think sometimes the prestige comes with the amount of money that's given out, you know, sure. the Nobel Prize being, what is it, a million dollars, yeah. I think, or, or equivalent there too is, is a big deal. Um, and so the larger the prizes are, the better. Probably Elon Musk's one will have a big impact for, for a similar reason, um, given the kind of amount of money that can be winnable. But even then, I, you know, I worry that it's just going to be people who already were working on those problems, just applying for the grant or applying for the, the prize money, rather than it stimulating other people to be working. New on people, on which is one of the good mm. effects of a great exhibition. You might get a general public person thinking, oh, I could do this. I've got this problem I might want to yeah. fix. Yeah, I mean, prizes can yeah. be combined as well. So the Great Exhibition had a, a prize jury, yeah, prize right, jury. that would look and try to find the best of the best within each category, um, internationally drawn group of experts, and they would give out prizes. And in, in France, they had, for the, the national level ones, you know, they would hand out a Légion d'honneur to someone who happened to be the best of the best within some of these uh, categories. So, you know, there's, there's ways I think of combining those two, which might actually make it, make the prize stand out even more by being associated with the event, 
rather than having a price and building things around that. Sure. And I think you've suggested, or one argument I think I've heard you articulate is that formal education may not necessarily be a good uh, predictor for um, invention, which I think is quite interesting for then people who, who aren't going down a formal route saying, I can be an inventor. Uh, do you think this is still true today and, and why might that be? And you have, I guess, um, a small movement, say, Peter Thiel has these uh, fellowships where you, you're purposely not allowed to go to university because it might open up different avenues um, of thought. So I, I'm interested in whether you think you know, maybe formal education not needed for being uh, an inventor today and, and perhaps why that might be. Yeah, so I think invention itself is, is more of an attitudinal thing. Um, so I like to describe it as, as an improving mentality that the people who do our, who invent things are people who see room for improvement where other people perhaps don't. Um, and then they work at solutions um, to the problems that they've created. So in a way, the first step is kind of whining and complaining about things saying, oh, this could be better. Like it's not so great really after all and, and not being satisfied with the way things are. Um, but what makes them much more interesting than just people complaining about things is that they then actually try to find the solutions as well. So it's those two things combined, which I think is, is, is the most interesting thing to look at. But the first step really ultimately is against, you know, people who are saying um, it is broke and I want to fix it rather than kind of being satisfied saying that I'm, you know, if it ain't broke, I, if it ain't broke, don't, don't try to fix it. Um, so you know, there's that the problem identification is the is the crucial thing there. And then what happens after you've identified the problem is that actually you don't necessarily um, need to have been skilled in the industry that you're trying to improve. There's that you know typically inventors you just self educate, um, which is easier than ever today thanks to the kind of information technologies that we have. To the extent that things like YouTube have uh, have opened up tacit knowledge to us in a way that wasn't really there before. You know, could be that. Um, getting the expertise to solve a problem used to involve, you know, at least spending a few years, you know, doing an apprenticeship, looking at copying someone else and trying to get those kind of tacit things that can't be written down, communicated just through the written word or the text. Uh, nowadays, I think video is breaking that barrier to the extent that you could effectively do an apprenticeship with someone a million miles away um, and it would, it would be just as good or close to as good. Um, or they rely on other experts, you know, in the same way that for you to have a life changing app idea, you don't necessarily need to be a software engineer, you can rely on other people and you can, as long as you've got a clear idea of, of how you're going to go about of, of the improvements that are being envisaged there, you can still be an innovator in that way, but with a bit of a division of labor going on. And that's why I think that's where I think teams, when they innovate, actually do it properly, is that there are people who are doing different stages of the invention process, you know, the ideation, um, the implementation, the iteration, and then improvement of, of along certain lines alongside that as well. Um, so, yeah, I've forgotten the original question, but that's... It, uh, I hope it that was, so it's, <laughs> it's whether formal education was needed, and basically your answer is, is no, because mindset is more important, yeah, which it means... it could help, right? So it's, 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 it's yeah, so my, my qualifier there is that, obviously, if you are a software engineer and you come up with an app idea, that it's helpful if you already know something code, about the yeah. process, <laughs> and you know what's possible, for example, or you know some of the limitations... Um, that said, sometimes knowing limitations can be a bad thing, right? So there are cases in history where sometimes the complete novice actually had an insight into these things or, or not so much had an insight, was, but was willing to waste their time and experimentation in a way that the experienced person wouldn't be. Um, so Bessemer and Steele is a great example of this, where he's told by all of the iron metallurgists, do don't bother, yeah. it's not possible. And he says, well, I want to have a go anyway, because that's just what he'd been doing for decades and decades. He's already been an inventor in sorts of all, all sorts of other ways. Um, but he says, you know, I had nothing to unlearn. And that was the benefit there and that he was kind of rebuilding something from scratch. Now, not everyone's going to be a Bessemer. Some people might kind of listen to this and start to reinvent a field and discover that actually the experts were right all along. Okay. And they just wasted, you know, years and years. But... but Invention is inherently wasteful in many ways, right? Experimentation is inherently yeah, wasteful. A lot of failure or failure. There is a lot of failure or, or there are or a lot of snags First attempt at learning, they say. Yeah. F-A-I-L. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is why I'm really uh, um, excited by your idea about this mindset. I First of all, it goes into all of these books where you had the growth mindset. Now, uh, I don't know, you've got the scout mindset and things, but it is because it's not 
just curiosity, although curiosity of a problem complaining as an element, but then going to do something about it. And maybe this idea of stamina, like keeping at it as well. So that about these qualities, which are just subtly different from just being, oh, curious about the world. I'm curious. You can read a lot about it, but then you have to do yeah. something and then not quite give up. You kind of keep um, you kind of keep going on, which I think is really interesting. So I think there's one thing. This is this is a really important point that you're raising here, which is that I know I haven't let, even let you finish the question, oh, but there no, is a, there's an important point here, which I want to, to tease out, which is that sometimes I'll hear, you know, kids are naturally innovative. The problem is the education system it has stifled kids. You know, they naturally experiment, they naturally tinker. Now, that's true. I think kids are naturally creative. And a lot of us are in general. And that sometimes, you know, we, we, we learn conformity in, in some ways or we, you know, sometimes our creativity is poo-pooed enough that we kind of give up on certain elements of it or, or we kind of restrict ourselves in terms of the kinds of things we reveal. But that's not quite what I'm talking about when it comes to the improving mentality is that, yes, curiosity and yes, the kind of creativity is maybe an extremely useful in finding those solutions but there's a lot more direction going on right there's a lot more you know kids who are experimenting with stuff aren't necessarily identifying problems and then finding solutions i don't think that's going on they're just tinkering and you know creating random things um, but they're not necessarily thinking about the applications of those things or their usefulness um, now maybe once in a while maybe one in a hundred inventions turns out to have arisen that way where someone just kind of is randomly doing something and through the kind of natural bubbling up, bubbling up of their creativity that they create something that they then think, okay, it solves this problem. Uh, but that I think, you know, is actually one of the problems with how people, the public at large thinks about invention is that we always have this idea of, you know, maybe it used to be people in some R&D lab in some major company like Xerox or something or Bell Labs, but nowadays it's just, you know, a bunch of people in smart suits sitting around a whiteboard and kind of, or maybe not even smart suits in, in kind of t-shirts and shorts sitting around a whiteboard and kind of coming up with ideas and brainstorming. Um, but in actual fact, I think when it's people just noticing the problem and saying, let's find the solutions, that's when the creativity comes perhaps in as useful as a kind of means to an end rather than the end in itself. Yeah, as, as you hinted to earlier, sort of ideation or the idea, but then whatever you're doing, say uh, modeling, prototype, testing, iterating, an idea to like, oh, maybe we need to shave off this, move that, do this, prototyping, iterating, and measuring, oh, it may, that went the wrong way, so maybe we need to do mm. the reverse. That sort of effort involved being directed yeah. much more than just, oh, genius, I thought about. I've increasingly about been idea. saying, been calling it kind of, maybe I should be calling it the optimizing mindset in some ways. It's like, who are these people, you know, who's your friend who has an Excel spreadsheet for like a particular activity that they do and like optimizes the efficiency of that particular thing? Like, I know a few people who have applied that to like going to the gym or something, right? That's, yeah, self improvement. Yeah. It's actually still improvement. It's the same mindset at play there is that they've realized there's a particular activity they do and they but they also want to make sure they do it as, as efficiently and as you know as best they, they possibly possibly can yeah i agree i guess the the one uh, extra i would add is if you're working in small team or large team you don't need necessarily everyone to have that because you might have the one person who's working much more on the ideation or, or how to tweak it mm. it's still their underlying current because that that's what your team is working on but someone's very good at the kind of recording measuring iterating and someone's kind of very good at like oh, actually, maybe we should try this or maybe we should try that. Um, actually, that leads me on to this sort of follow up about how invention works, because I, I guess when you go back, you know, two or three hundred years ago, maybe you did have these kind of singular inventors. Uh, they do were speaking to a lot of other people, but maybe it was just them and, and the, some of them assistants. But today it's kind of it very much seems to be uh, more small teams, large teams, although we can get to I'm interested in whether we should back the person or the or the or the, or the project. Um, I'm thinking, what do you think works best for innovation? What are the strengths and weaknesses between say smaller teams, larger teams, iterative teams, and or do you think this myth of, I've said it's myth, so maybe it's not, of you know just the lone inventor, how true does that actually happen? And, and how important is, is teaming and thinking about that for innovation? Yeah, I mean, I think if there's a division of labor amongst, so, my problem with people saying, oh, invention isn't this individual thing is that for me, it's, it kind of brings to mind as though invention is something that happens by committee. 
um, you know, it, the people sitting around the whiteboard. I don't think that's what happens. I think it is much more divided and there's a lot more individual effort that's then combined. In the same way that science overall, right, we have lots of scientists doing their own thing and then through their interaction, we get science, right? This kind of thing, um, which is their accumulated and kind of, not even accumulated, but often being tested kind of knowledge. Um, and where there's a lot of individual effort is then kind of through various other impersonal mechanisms combined into something else of its own. Um, and I think that's what happens with technology as well. I think that's what happens with invention is that really we do, we should think of it as something that happens on the individual level. Um, and we should take seriously the fact that people who work in teams are ultimately individuals doing a bit of invention. Um, but it's through their combined marginal improvements that we sometimes get the the invention right if we want to kind of start sure. to put it into a box um, that again is why it, this comes back it come, ultimately comes back to this focus on marginality this focus on the kind of small tweaks and implementations and kind of small changes um that yeah we we it's we we're, we're right to say that in an invention isn't just the product of a single genius necessarily, although it might be, um, but that even that thing is drawing upon prior improvements, right? Sure. Um, Newton famously said he stood, he could see further because he stood on the shoulders yeah. of giants, shoulders, right? Yes. I mean, that's something that all inventors must do, right? There's no way that they're not doing Build that because they're, pre they're building on previous improvements that other people have done. Um, and that's either something that happens outside of a team because you've got some inventor down the shed, garden shed is working on a thing and has read about something and then comes up with their own improvement. But I don't think them doing that is any is actually that much qualitative, qualitatively different than if they'd been in the same room with the person they just read about their invention. They're kind of bouncing ideas off one another. Perhaps bringing the inventor from their garden shed and into the room will speed things up a bit. And that's perhaps where the team comes in useful. But ultimately, it's still individual. And do you have a view, so some of the literature suggests that at a certain point, a size of team doesn't work as well when you're working on a, on a project. In extremists, I think if you're getting 300 people to work on something, it doesn't seem to work as well as, as sort of three people, three to 12 people teams. Although uh, the data, the, the project's a bit mixed because you don't have many experiments on it. But do, do you think you'd have a view there or is it hard to say? I mean, I, I don't know much about the the intricacies of, in, of innovation management. But what that sounds like is, you know, where there's a problem often is in what you might call the research element that you have to do to prevent yourself doing any wasted research of your own. So wasted invention of your own. You know, if you are someone yeah. who comes up with, I don't know, some improvement to the mop, um, you know, they made a whole movie about this, um, Joy, which is, which is quite an interesting one. So if you come up with an improvement to the mop, if you're gonna get your patent on that, which is in some ways, even if it, you're not, it's not necessarily going to exploit it that commercially, it's going to be your proof that you are the inventor of this, this margin improvement. You're going to have to go and do a whole lot of research before you even start, I think, doing much of the tinkering to work out if your thing is original at all and someone hasn't already done it. Um, now, when you have hundreds or thousands of people all working on those sorts of improvements, that becomes a bit of a slog and requires yeah. wasted effort almost, you know, research for people to even kind of do the search before they then even start doing other stuff. Um, that's where maybe I can see there being problems today, that there's such a proliferation of stuff. Um, there's so much going on that it's difficult to know where to put your own attentions. Um, you know, there is this idea, very harmful idea, that there's nothing new under the sun. Um, in actual fact, very often there is, you know, the sun has not seen a lot of interesting yeah. things that uh, you'd think were quite obvious. Um, but I think having that extra bit of self-confidence to be the person to say no this is actually original this is new no one else has done this um is i think perhaps a very useful attribute of, of inventors and perhaps is why you know some inventors are accused of, or innovators accused of being quite egotistical and so on maybe there's a kind of correlation there between the person who's bold enough to say this is this is this is brand new um that someone who would there does seem to be a, a partial element of that you think of someone like elon musk who thinks of himself as an engineer being just somewhat off mainstream can can sometimes seemingly be helpful so mm. actually that I, so large teams small teams I, and then people have conflicting theories over that i do think there is a duplication uh, element 
there's also an element of potentially you want to follow the person rather than project. And if you have 300 people, not all of them really want to be on the project and there's mm. just things like that. But I, I was then maybe interested and maybe you don't have a view, but if you were then in charge of a corporate R and D lab or some sort, maybe say in tech or software or even biology, um, do you think there's a, there's a way of organizing or doing that you sort of have an insight of over history that you think maybe they could do a little bit more and therefore be a bit more effective or, is it sort of too unique to the culture and projects of the actual organization to have any insights? It's a really interesting question. Now, what's interesting, I guess, about my own research is it's almost wholly concentrated on the pre-lab era, where it's overwhelmingly individuals doing stuff, often in concert with one another. And, you know, they're part of communities of engineers where they're all working on this separate thing. Um, yeah, I guess I'd be don't interested have to I would, yeah, that's the interesting thing, whether the modern world has something to learn from how we did it before. So technical change there. I'll re-ask the question, which was essentially, if you're in charge of a corporate R&D lab or, or thinking about R&D today, um, are there any learnings that you might have had from your historical perspective on innovation? Yeah, so it's an interesting question because largely the period I've studied is that one before the rise of the corporate R&D lab, which is kind of late 19th century kind of thing, really takes off in the 20th century. And then we and perhaps we've seen a decline since then um, in the mid 20th century uh, and late 20th century in particular. Um, so, you know, a lot of my insight is cut from this era of individuals. Now, they're not necessarily just people just working on their own in isolation. They're certainly part of communities of engineers, you know, London engineers, people, the people who were um, starting the kind of standardization that you have of mechanical parts you know these are people who are doing their individual stuff possibly with their own individual companies um, it's their apprentices are going off and setting up rival companies that then do it using other kinds of machinery but are still then improving on the standardization that's taken place at, their, at the parent company or the kind of yeah where they where they, their previous masters have been doing stuff um, but ultimately it's something that you know was was done by individuals there um, so in terms of you know, lessons from it, it's, it's hard to say. Now, one possibility there is that during, over the course of the late 19th century, we saw the improvement of improvement and, you know, improvement of the process of invention, which then gave rise to the corporate R&D lab. And I, I think there's possibly something to that. Um, but again, because I've not really said it in detail, I couldn't say for sure. Um, that's kind of a, an open question for me sure. still, and perhaps something I'll have to work on in the future. Well, I, I, if we'd solved this, then progress studies would, would not be such a hot topic in terms of how we, how we think about progress. So you, you might not have anything to say on, on this one either, but I will ask it anyway. So this was, hmm. that was sort of on the corporate R&D lab. Um, but then here in the UK, uh, we're about to launch, um, I think it's nicknamed ARIA, which is um, hmm. um, modeled on the US um, DARPA or ARPA-E, you know, it's aside from NIH, but I guess we're talking about government-funded innovation labs. And I was just thinking, you know, if you were going to give advice to the new executive director, or maybe you would be the new executive director of ARIA yourself, so sure. uh, what, do you think, <laughs> what do you think it should be doing or not? And I'll give a, maybe another little preamble to work into this. It's because there is this idea now that maybe we should be sponsoring more more people rather than projects. And if, if you look at actually little labs at the moment, they're often led by a lab leader mm. who's having these ideas. And then they have, you know, three to 12 people or teams working under them with their own kind of research projects, which they are sort of feeding into the, and they're then constantly talking with the lab director of thinking, oh, let's how we do this. And actually even in corporate uh, R&D labs, there is, there is a touch of that, although it, it's changed a lot. Uh, and UK ARIA seems to be going through, maybe they're going to do a, um, a program manager approach, but it does seem to be quite open. So um, mm. yeah, executive director, UK ARIA, any advice for them? Yeah, so I guess the, the question is the model that's going to be adopted here. So I think one of the things that you often hear, at least within the mythology of DARPA, ARPA, whatever, is that it's funding of the kind of blue skies research that doesn't necessarily have a particular application yet. And you just kind of want to see where the, you know, throw some money at, at people doing kind of research without having to answer too many questions and have too much oversight and see what happens and then perhaps start looking at applications. Um, now, maybe there's something to that, but yeah, I guess I'm, 
I still think an organization like that perhaps needs a kind of framing of problems. So in terms of strategic oversight, you know, I, I think I've always assumed that there's a problem in the back of people's minds. Um, perhaps the, another model to look at here is what happens during World War II, where you have in the UK and the US, you have these kind of defense, or you have, you have experts in various fields brought into close proximity and asked to kind of find things that will help the war effort. Um, and then, so you've got some framing of problems there, and perhaps you have specific problems identified for them to solve. And then that's the kind of research model is that the individuals through conversations and through just their own research will be coming up with, with solutions to work on. Uh, there was a book I read a few years ago, and I'm not sure how historically accurate a lot of it is, um, because it was a biography, it focused on the achievements of an individual. Um, it was called uh, Churchill's, Ice, uh, Churchill's Iceman. Um, so someone who works in one of these World War II British laboratories and is coming up with ideas like, you know, instead of building these vast aircraft carriers, why don't we, why don't we use icebergs and kind of create artificial icebergs and then you can land planes on them. Now, I don't know how feasible that, that work is, but he also comes up with all sorts of other ideas which do have, you know, interesting applications like trying to draw the Germans out into, or the Nazis out into Norway through the use of you know troops on on what would be later become snowmobiles you know this is this is pretty interesting fun fun work but again even even though it sounds quite random and sort of out there it still has that basic purpose there the application is actually in you know at the forefront of their mind even not even at the back of their mind that you know this is the strategy that we should use and here's a way to solve that strategy even though the means there is quite creative and out there um, so, yeah, I, th I think there's potential that ARPA or ARIA, or whatever, you know, perhaps ends up being giving a lot of funding to people who are working on interesting things and just for them to carry on doing those things. Um, but where I think things get really interesting from the kind of state funded model isn't so much the blue sky stuff, but is actually, which I think a lot of the universities supported sector perhaps really does. Um, but it's more in solving particular challenges where a lot more investment in, in solving those challenges could be could be very useful. Um, so perhaps something to do with climate change. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, sure. the governments all have their strategic kind of yeah. ideas um, about things they want to have improvements in. Yeah, I have a I have a personal view that they should be looking at some of these things where there's a lot of uh, public good, but private companies might not necessarily uh, be looking into it and some things which are sort of controversial or anecdotal which could just do with better study like I'm going to make it up but personal personal productivity if, if it's really true that if we can work in psychological flow and be that much more productive then surely we should be doing lots of research on on something like that or if it's really true that intermittent fasting is really going to work for you that's not something that a private company is really going to ever make that much money for or be interested in and and therefore we should look at it or someone like um people think educational mastery may or may not be a thing but actually the, the work is quite patchy and no one's going mm. to really look at it we should really look at like progress studies or how we teach these things which could be studied but i think you're right that it would then stem from having a really interesting program behind it like this is the application like this is how we're going to learn better and then yeah. get some kind of people thinking like oh right that's the problem i really i really kind of want to work yeah on. that's the that, i mean that's the interesting thing is that ultimately it's going to come down to who is chosen you know to work people. there what projects are so even if we we take the people not projects approach which i think has a lot of merit um especially so and probably more than most i think that that approach has has a lot of merit then which people are we choosing? Because they're going to have their own projects in mind that they're probably already working for and they want to get a bit of funding for. Um, so yeah, it's the, that, the strategic direction there is going to be very, very important. So whoever's in charge is going to be having to make some hard decisions because whoever they don't choose perhaps is not going to be working on this thing at all. Yeah, that's true. And then there's that kind of almost mystical but very important piece of that culture piece, which I think is goes back to your uh, kind of inventing mindset of having a, a, a culture of of rewarding or thinking about like this and the the tension between not knowing what you're doing so that you can do something a bit different or new but then working in in the field I think about Paul Graham's Y Combinator and mm. that partly has seeded this whole model of seeding VC which has been really important 
but he it would, the way he tells it is he partly did it because he didn't know he couldn't do it right so it, this that model came from that although obviously he had all of these other things but then the other thing about why it's been very difficult to replicate in say other countries is because there's something particular about the culture and the people that you also form uh, that makes it something work and why why combinator really works for that but essentially you haven't although it's seeded a lot of other ideas and that whole thing you haven't actually had uh, a Y com a UK Y combinator, for instance, yeah. or actually any other any other one really. So it's this really weird blend, which I'm hoping progress studies make some insights into, but we certainly don't seem to have the yeah, answer. I think in in that case, success breeds success, and that yeah, it, it, if you had a lot more people in the UK, and there's two steps here. If you had a lot more people in the UK who get very very rich and successful off of their An invention. innovation yeah. in particular. <laughs> And then didn't just retire to the home counties to some big mansion and not talk to anyone ever again, but then decided it's up to them to also give back to the community of inventors in particular, not kind of on, yeah. not even necessarily giving back to, you know, giving a lot of money to charities or whatever, uh, but decided that the thing they want to do is raise the next generation of themselves in some ways. Um, then that's what you require for that to happen. As, exactly. For it to be yeah. bottom up, I think you, I think you I, definitely I think this is that. the bit which you sort of, we touched upon the sort of reputation or prestige or, you know, want to call it purpose, you know, life purpose or whatever, this kind of intangible thing to touch upon about why you might want, uh, why you want, might want to do something. Like people even going to VC is crazy. Like financially, it makes very little sense, I think. There's much more kind of secure things you could do with your money, I suspect, than throwing money at some crazy ideas. But the fact that it's a very prestigious thing for a successful entrepreneur in, in, in California to do is what's helpful there. Again, invention is wasteful. And I think that the question is, how do you create a culture that can accommodate that waste? Yes. Um, and that's the, perhaps the key thing there. And maybe I'm going to say, because I learned a new word reading your book as well. Um, I don't know how whether you pronounce it correctly. It's a, a gym crack. Is it a gym crack or is it a gym crack? Well, that's a good Which, question. I think it's a gim crack. It is a gim crack. Kind of okay, I pronounce it. Yeah. So a gim crack. But I actually thought that actually gim cracks are quite a good sign because if these are useless inventions coming out, which is what a gim crack kind of means, and it's kind of used in a slightly derogatory way, but I'm actually, mm. actually, that's quite good because you're getting this flow of ideas and things coming up and you can recognize them as gim cracks, which is great. But, you know, you for every hundred, like you say, you're going to have to have 99 gim cracks to get one, one which isn't. Uh, and we yeah, don't have it's that a sign that anymore. something's working. You're it's a right. sign of something's like, working. Yeah, exactly. When, there's, like... when there are bad ideas coming to you um, as an inventor, then that's actually a sign that there's enough yeah. people who think that being an inventor is a good thing, that you're getting the crazies and the cranks and the people who don't really know what they're doing, but they kind of have the wish to be identify as, as an inventor. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. So maybe trying to move to the last two or three sort of, actually, I've got a few more questions. So we'll see how we do for time. Different. So one of those is that, is that success breeds success is kind of what you said. I was really interested, particularly in history, it's probably different today, but why certain inventions didn't stick or also to your point that actually there were some small things or even not so small, which in some respects should have been obvious to a lot of people, but, but didn't. Um, you give a lot of examples of, of small improvements sort of industrially. Uh, one I always think about is this idea that we've talked a lot about within healthcare now, but also in other fields of, of the double blind trial, which seems mm. to have to be rediscovered. Um, we kind of think that maybe Captain Cook uh, did one around scurvy. He gave some people mm. uh, lemons or not or citrus fruit. Um, but it seems to have been rediscovered over the ages. But as a concept, that I, uh, and maybe that was also prevalent in Babylonian times, but the idea of a kind of A not B test, you know, trialing with one group and the other and comparing, is actually an idea which could have happened and probably did happen quite a lot, but didn't really stick until relatively recently and actually didn't move away from healthcare into, say, economic uh, randomized control trials that we have today until relatively late. So I'm kind mm. of interested in dispersion of invention and what makes it and what makes it stick and, and whether is that a mindset cultural idea or is there also something more complicated going on there this is probably quite a difficult uh, question to come out just um, a blank like that but i have thought about something like double blind and then my follow-on thinking while i'm just talking is that the value of the double blind test this is going to the to the stuff you can't measure has been immeasurable you couldn't do any really pharmaceutical development 
until you understood that. And that's something which doesn't go into, into measurements, these kind of some of these general purpose ones. Mm -hmm. But it's also gone into economics and all of these other fields uh, uh, because of that. Uh, so that's a kind of another element. But I was kind of thinking, yeah, what makes certain inventions stick or not? And has that changed? Does it to do with the mindset with something like double blind? Or in your book, you have a lot of these things where you kind of look at it and go, well, they, they could have invented this a lot earlier. And then they got around and someone or someone did at this point in time and, and it stuck. Yeah, I mean, the question of why certain things don't get adopted at certain times is a, a particularly fascinating thing. I think there is a certain kind of activation energy to adopting an invention, and that can be the biggest hurdle. Um, and because adopt, adoption is costly, right? So the double blind trial is a good example, perhaps, of, you know, if you're in a field where you're reasonably certain that something is true, then you're probably not bothered to, you know, put subject it to this gold standard, very costly way of doing things versus the other things that are available to you. Uh, in medicine, obviously, the, the, the risks of, you know, creating something that then does something awful is perhaps higher than it would be in, in, an, in another science or in another, another field. So I can see the, the kind of cost benefit analysis for someone deciding whether or not to adopt something is perhaps very different there. Now, I don't know the specifics of that case. Uh, one thing I have been looking into is the printing press. Um, and it's spread or, you know, this is actually, a, you, know, you can have advanced notice here. This is my next um, Substack piece. I mean, a very, very long investigation of why the Ottoman Empire for about 300 years doesn't adopt the printing press for Arabic script in particular. So that's for Arabic and Turkish, um, both those languages at the time having been in, in, written in Arabic script. And it's a kind of interesting question. It's not, so in 1727, you get this official Ottoman press before then, it's done by minorities, um, but again, never in Arabic script. So you've got Jewish printing presses in, in Istanbul, you've got Armenian presses being set up, Greek presses. Uh, there seem to be a few even Protestant presses in the kind of Ottoman ruled Hungary. Um, so there's all sorts of, there's use of this technology, but it for some reason isn't adopted by the majority or even by the kind of ruling majority in particular. Um, and you think that's kind of crazy. That's a very useful thing to have, a printing press. Now, the thing is, there are obviously counter, counter arguments to it. You've got lobby groups against it. Um, you know, scribes, even in Europe, in Western Europe, you know, they, they were opposed to the introduction of the printing press. There are stories of scribes perhaps burning down the printing house in, in Moscow because they were angry at the, the printer who had set up there in the 16th century. Though I'm not, not sure how much to credit that story. Um, at the same time, there are potentially political concerns. You know, having seen the wars of religion in France, the Ottoman Emperor was probably like, oh, I probably don't want to have introduce, you know, new ideas, you know, new religious ideas into my country that might spread as a result of printing. It has to be something that's either, either I have to have a lot of censorship or maybe I don't bother with censorship at all. Um, or there's an even more prosaic kind of boring view, which is probably the correct view based on what I've seen so far, which is that it's actually just a very costly thing to do. You require a lot of paper, you require metals. The printing press itself is a very large, cumbersome piece of equipment. You know, it weighs a lot. Um, there, are there are very small technical problems to, to overcome when it comes to Arabic script with ligatures versus a kind of plain alphabet where you don't have to connect up the letters in particular ways. Uh, now that's something that could be overcome either through adopting a kind of script where you don't bother using ligatures anymore, which is something that's possible, um, or you have to come up with improvements that solve it. So there's something, there's another hurdle to overcome there. Uh, but enough of those small costly hurdles means that perhaps it's just the sort of in te technology that requires some kind of direction from the top. It required patronage. And actually the interesting thing about the printing press even in Europe is very often rulers in a country actually took active measures to introduce the, te the technology to their country. They used patents of monopoly. Um, they used, you know, funding and kind of, you know, active, proactively actually kind of giving money to the potential person who's going to bring the printing press over from France or Germany or wherever um, in order to spread this thing. Um, so I think very often a failure of adoption of certain things um, isn't so much that there's any particular blockage so much as it is that there's just someone not taking the proactive steps to do it, to doing it. And that's what you see in the 1720s is someone who, who goes on a visit to France um, in a period where there's also a kind of what's called the kind of tulip period in, in Ottoman history, where there is this kind of pro-Western approach amongst certain factions in the Ottomans court, where they're looking at 
at the West and saying, look at what France is doing. We should have gardens and canals and printing and observatories and all these other things that for some reason our courtly culture hasn't adopted for a long time, even though it's had very strong economic and diplomatic ties to countries that have had all those things. Um, so yeah, I think very often it's nothing to do with a barrier per se, but just that you actually require in, an, an inventor to, to take a very simple idea from one from well, one field to another. I like your idea, you said earlier in our conversation that you need an activation energy and that activation energy has to probably come from a person because it's partly maybe cost money technical and partly reputational like someone's doing something new someone's got to take the reputational kind of like well that's a bit weird that's not what we do right so you're doing something new and that mm. almost always has to come from like a little body or a person to go on I'll I'll do this I'll normalize it and and if it requires a little bit of technical and money those are the extra hurdles on that yeah. Okay, so pivoting very slightly, or not really because it's on type, into this idea of copyright. Um, I've read your very interesting paper on the idea that uh, copyright today is maybe not quite fit for purpose. So this is a, 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 the way that actually uh, copyright things have, have evolved um, over time. But there's also an intersectional idea of that, I think, risen from time to time. Matt Inglesias has said it more recently, that copyright might be too long in the trade-off mm. between sort of invention and that, uh, which is actually not a new idea. I think Milton Friedman uh, also argued that maybe copyright is too long. And certainly if you look at patents, which are generally about 20 years, mm -hmm. copyright at 50 years plus death definitely seems long. So uh, I wondered whether you'd maybe sum up this idea is, is copyright too long? And the, I, of where we're going on digital as well, have um, nations governments not really thought hard enough about the complications that will bring to copyright yeah so i think i mean there's a whole load of this is a real thicket but i think i think in, in terms of intellectual property copyright is the one that's most in need of improvement now i do personally think that copyright is too long you know 20 years is a pretty good time to have a monopoly on things um, having your entire lifetime plus 50 sometimes even 70 sometimes even more years is ridiculous Right. I can see maybe the case for, you know, being able to pass on the pass on copyright ownership and copyright to your children, but to your great grandchildren or great great grandchildren, this is getting, you know, a bit out of hand, um, especially if we have this idea that copyright should be a temporary monopoly um, with the idea that it should strike a balance between promoting creativity by giving an artificial monopoly at the start. Um, and then kind of also not getting in the way of people improving further on the things that you've done and taking those things and, and, and running with them. It doesn't incentivize um, your children to write anymore. No, at all actually. It probably yeah. does exactly <laughs> the, the opposite, opposite because they can, they can live off those proceeds. Um, now, on the other hand, there is obviously an argument that the, the market around copyrighted works can emerge um, when it is property, right? So you can have licensing regimes and so on. Now, some of the things I point out in that paper is that, for example, it's very difficult to actually often identify um, the owners of work simply because they're so old, right? So you may not, so even if you could work out who the original artist of something was, to work out who their great, great grandchild who happened to inherit the rights is actually almost impossible sometimes. Um, particularly given nowadays that the process we have is that copyright is vested in you the moment you create something, the moment you have a fixed form. So the moment I write, you know, a doodle down on a piece of paper, that's my copyrighted work, um, so long as it is original. Now, again, the other thing there is I can simply assert my copyright all the time and just say, this is mine. And the only way we're going to ever test that is in court, because there's no way of registering and then having, you know, the registration being contested like you would with a patent or with any other, you know, with trademark or anything else. Um, so there's this a great deal of strength in copyright. Now, the thing is, a lot of that stuff, I think, emerged in the context of weakness of enforcement. Now, ultimately, it comes down to the person who is claiming ownership of a copyrighted material to enforce their claims and to find infringers and to, you know, bring them to task and say, look, you need to pay your license fees, whatever, and, you know, to bring them to court. Now, I think, well, I've even noticed that in the past few years, the ability of owners to enforce copyright is getting much, much easier. So we're going to, I think, in the next decade or so, have a situation where we've got near infinite copyright, at least in terms of any, for the, from the perspective of any creator, with extreme strength. 
that is extremely easy to enforce because we've got so used to this idea that you know you can rip off CDs and have torrents and you know download all this stuff and yeah okay we'll we'll give the people the the creators a sop in terms of kind of legal powers to try and prevent this stuff uh, but let's imagine a case where we can effectively automate, we can scrape the web for infringements and have automated services that will send, you know, subpoenas or whatever you, you require, um, you know, just like that, without you even having to, you know, really go through the task of doing all these things. And we're already starting to see these things emerge. Uh, I've, you know, I've noticed that people have been paying fees, back license fees, for, you know, using some stock photo that they just found and they put it on their blog. And they're getting emails, you know, five, six, seven emails from some company saying, on behalf of the owner of this, you know, the photographer, I'm trying to get, you know, 10,000 10, pounds off you for having used this thing once and then forgotten about it many years even later. Even worse than patent trolls. Um, yeah, even worse than patent trolls in, in many ways. Um, now, the US system is kind of interesting because on the one hand, it encourages some forms of creativity because there are all sorts of ways in which you can claim fair use. Um, now, the problem with fair use is, is it is itself contested. And so you, you see all sorts of different um, legal cases in the US where you know, the next legal case can have a huge impact on what counts as being copyrighted or not. Um, so things like fan art, you know, that a lot of people who will upload fan art based on a, a copyrighted material will claim fair use for that. Now, in a country like the UK, you just don't have that, right? We have what's called fair dealing, which is, you know, it almost sounds quite similar, but it's basically just a few rules set out specifically um, that are, um, you know, um, exceptions to copyright. Ultimately, in the UK, unless you happen to be within these very, very few, you know, five, six, seven, whatever it is, exceptions, then whatever you're doing is almost certainly breaching copyright, like infringing on copyright. So if you happen to, I don't know, upload a, uh, you know, write some Doctor Who fan, fan fiction and upload a book somewhere, you have broken the rules in the UK. Now in the US, you might be able to claim your fair use and maybe, you know, there's the chance that the BBC or whoever owns the copyright is not going to come and pursue you through the courts and, you know, try to get you to pay up. They may just simply ask you to cease and desist. Um, but the fact that they can is, I think, worrying for the future. Now, the big worry, I think, especially is going to be video games. Right now, you see mods of all sorts of kinds. You know, I've seen popular games where there's like the Lord of the Rings mod and the Game of Thrones mod. It's like, these things are not licensed, as far as I can tell. Like, I've seen no nowhere that these things have been licensed. And people are putting enormous amounts of creativity and energy into these things. And for the better, right? This is, yeah. these are, they're creating things that loads of people, like the meticulous things that loads of people have, you know, put a lot of effort into and a lot of people are benefiting from, but they haven't paid for it. You know, often they're doing this thing kind of not even for, for profit themselves, um, but they haven't paid for it. And there's a, there's a very real risk that maybe not this year, maybe not next year, maybe not in 10 years time, but maybe in 100 years time, the children of the people who, you know, were the owners of this, this original property are going to start taking those people to task for it. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there's, to use our other phrase, I don't think there's enough activation energy about wanting to try and look at this, but I, I do think so. I think there's a couple of ideas you propose which seem really useful to take up was one idea that maybe the patent office can be extended to rule on when a transformation might be a, a fair use. So in advance, so that you can know like these type of, of things, you know, found art, file poetry, transformation of fan fiction. No, no, we're gonna accept those because the trade off the other way. Um, the other thing is when you get um, orphan copyright things, so you can't find the original author and you say, well, let's say it lapses after 40 years and you can get another 40 years if you, if you sort of, you know, relicense it. But uh, the presumption is after 40 years, then actually it's lapsed because actually 90% of work, it doesn't have a value after that. It's something like maybe 10 or 20 spent there. So often it put it into that. Now, if you want to want to claim it at that 40 years and you're active, it should be very easy for you to con continue that, but then to put the presumption Within yeah, that. so with orphan works, the presumption at the moment is on the potential user. They need to yes. basically pay a license it's, fee, and then seems to this me license the fee for some reason will go to the person who claims it. You know, many years hence. Um, for the sake of invention, it, it seems to be the wrong owners, right? Yeah, and I think it should be on the owners to say this is ours, and if you want to use it, here's where to find us now. That's the main thing. Is you know the analogy I like to use is like imagine we had a property system 
where like you literally didn't know who owned what yeah. you know and and you tried to have a, a property market like a housing market you know where where something that had happened to be you know while we we don't have a centralized land registry or it has all sorts of problems in the uk like we still at least could fi find out with a reasonable de degree of certainty who owns the property um you know through a bit of inquiry but imagine you have some kind of artwork or or especially when when you have very complex media video games being a great example where it's actually a combination of lots and lots and yeah. different um, copyright rights uh, now on the ipo being able to rule on stuff you know this was me proposing that the uk have something like the transformative use defense yes. um, or exception like they have in the us but one which isn't going to be one that's constantly litigated over and where the boundaries of it are going to shift all the time but where the ipo as you say can can sure. rule on these things or at least advise yeah. um, and say this is what we think it is and publicly say we this is what we think it is now that's giving a regulator a lot more power than they currently have but it's potentially a good thing if it reduces the wasted resources that you might have on disputes yeah i mean you, you don't give the power to the regulator you're simply doing it to judges who are making common law on things like and tends to be more important cases like you know a, a harry potter fan fiction thing which may not be then readily a, applicable because you're only talking about these really high commercial level things well the other thing is there is actually very little law to draw upon so what happens in in practice is that pre loads of countries all over the world simply copy the us yeah. because they have a much more contested system um, where people are claiming that it's copyright or they're claiming fair use and then they're battling it out in the courts all the time you know that results in a lot of other countries especially even the uk where there's actually very little um, yeah, you... there are very very few copyright cases that even make it to court now there's yeah. probably a lot that's settled out of court um, but because it's settled out of court we're potentially seeing cases where people are paying non-owners for copyright stuff but there's no precedent being set that people can then cite and so we're often following the us precedent so i think having proper guidance on these issues is better um, yeah. now there are certain things in that report where i say we should copy the eu in some some respects in other respects where we should definitely not copy the eu um, where they've strengthened copyright owners rights in a way that just you know will have much bigger ramifications for other things um so a, a one that's hotly contested right now is uh is um whether or not um uh, plat internet platforms should take responsibility to to basically filter what's even being uploaded as to whether or not that's copyrighted before it's even up put up yeah, that's and there's all contested. sorts of controversy right now on youtube about people getting stuff taken down and their entire channels deleted because they were playing, you know, something by Bach or Beethoven. Yeah. Or a clip of five seconds of happy copy. birthday in the background or something. <laughs> yeah. But like the Bach or Beethoven where it isn't actually copyrighted, but someone is claiming copyright for a particular uh, yeah. version of it that they're saying is then being copied because a particular performance of Beethoven can be copyrighted. But obviously Beethoven's so long dead that this is in the public domain. Now, the fact that they're getting like the onus is, is, is on the person to prove that they haven't infringed is kind of interesting there and it's at the moment it's much too geared towards the the people claiming ownership um now the fact that the eu is you know and a lot of other countries are proposing that it's it's actually should be up to the platform to even filter stuff before it's put up i think we're going to see some really really horrible things as a result of that um particularly when you've got things like parody for example being at the moment exempted like there's a real minefield of cases that at the moment I think are just waiting to blow up. But again, because of the durations, it could be decades hence and, yeah. and it'll only become a scandal many, many years from now. We haven't, I don't think, designed these things for the long term. Yeah, no, I would agree. And I think um, just to sort of finish off on this, you know, people are not aware, like the US didn't have copyright on international works um, in the, you know, that only came in really in the early 1900s. Um, I think it's very interesting that there's an argument that you have two large biopharmaceutical companies based in Basel, Switzerland today because of where um, French dye patenting laws or process patents happened a couple of hundred years ago. Um, mm. So you should, you should look that up. That's really interesting about how nations used uh, patent laws defensively or offensively in that time, uh, also in Germany. And in fact, there's arguments that Japan itself only has a semiconductor industry 
because it held up IBM's semiconductors patents in the patent office for very many years, allowing their own home industry to essentially copy the patent before it's being issued to get them up to the scale and then issuing the patent when actually it was already not, not necessary. So there's a lot more which goes on with IP copyright patents than, um, than perhaps it would, it would, it would seem. I had these lots of second order and third order effects. Yeah, how interesting. I mean, the problem with copyright actually is it's so internationally regulated. There are a lot of international treaties that, you know, you can't implement a proper registration system. Some countries do anyway, like the US, it has a sort of orphan works type get around where it kind of requires that registration be done for certain legal rights to be to be used. Um, but actually, technically, the, the treaty forbids any such thing. Um, so any change that has to happen is now very, very difficult. It has to happen at a global level. Yeah, 180 um, plus country negotiation. Yeah, so that, I mean, it's one of the very few things I can think of where the UK can actually take a different copyright regime yeah, than actually, that of the EU. Post, post, Brexit, post Brexit, one area yeah. they can do something different. Uh, but even then, what I propose is a bit of adoption, and a bit of difference, you know, so it's... <laughs> cool. Yeah, so definitely, stuff. definitely check out that paper. Mm. Um, uh, so maybe last two uh, questions would be, would be, what did you learn from the US university system? I think you spent some time at Brown. Um, so interested, do you think uh, the liberal arts way of doing everything is, is superior to the more narrow way of UK or is there a different culture or just, um, yeah, any thoughts on your US university experience? Very different. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting um, teaching students who are drawn from a lot of different fields um, versus people who are already hyper specialized, you know, from actually late school level. And I think they're different systems. I think, I, but they have their advantages, they have their pros, their cons, and they should probably kind of, it'd be best if there's just a kind of mix of different systems that people use. And I think it's good to have that diversity of, of systems. Um, that's where I think the US is so interesting and in that there are so many different university models coexisting. Yeah. Um, which so, is less common in the UK. Yeah. And my, my parallel thought is that's the diversity of innovation organization and innovation funding is also something that maybe we should explore a little bit more, not just one way of doing things, but be mm. because of because of where it, it flows. Yeah, I think more models is better than fewer. Yeah. Sickly, exactly. Yeah. And this is it, because we get the flow of ideas, we get more of these uh, gim cracks. Okay, and then uh, last question on a sort of uh, personal productivity note is, um, what does a productive day look like for you? Do, or do you have any sort of ideas on personal productivity or also any advice you'd like to give to uh, independent researchers or, or wannabe hmm. um, inventors? Um, I mean, productive day for me looks like a lot of writing typically. Um, so earphones in, usually listening to video game or, or kind of epic movie soundtracks um, because they're often optimised, I think, for concentrating on something other than the music um, while also being quite kind of enjoyable things to listen to, um, to get into some kind of writing flow state typically um, for a few hours or so. And that's a, that's a pretty good day for me is getting some writing down because writing is a very difficult thing in, in general, even when you've done a lot of it, it doesn't quite get any easier to, to formulate things, put them on the page. Do you write every uh, day? Uh, no, I don't, definitely don't write every day. I know people like Tyler Cowan are very good at somehow day. finding the time in the mornings to, to do that. I'm very much an evening and night person though. And I think that's part of the problem is that evening and night is also like hanging out and watching TV kind of time. And so it's different. They, those the two things are mutually exclusive. Um, so if I maybe over time, I've become better at getting up in mornings, but I still find, I think that a morning for me will go by very quickly and then I'll actually start writing a bit later on once I've, once I've managed to, to kind of let things stew a bit. That said, you know, I think bums in seats is the main way to go. As long as you're sat and you're kind of at your workstation doing something, even if it's reading um, before writing, that's important. And the other thing is, yeah, I find while a good day is one where I've done a lot of writing, sometimes you've only been able to do that writing because you spent the entire previous you know, few days just reading and taking notes and not actually doing any kind of writing for popular consumption or for wider consumption than your own. 
So yeah, it's that's the thing that I often lose sight of, and it can be a bit anxiety-inducing, but actually is completely necessary to the whole the whole project. Yeah, you need thinking time for sure. And um, any advice for others? Except it seems to be definitely keeping an idea on an innovation uh, mindset, something like that. Is there anything else you'd give us advice? Yeah, so I think for you know the main message I have for people in a kind of evangelist kind of way is that it's worth adopting the improving mindset. I think, I think it's, you know, try to find problems in whatever and wherever, even if it's not something you're particularly concerned in and think up solutions to it. And it might be that you become particularly obsessed with particular solutions that can have an impact, even if that impact isn't profitable, even if that impact is for just a few people, I think that's a useful thing. You know, self-improvement just often just affects your, yourself, but it's still a, a thing that's worth doing a lot of the time. Um, and the more people who are affected by it, the better by any kind of improvement that you follow. And then once you've done, done those improvements, if they are particularly successful, I think the, the most important thing is then giving back to the next generation of people who are going to do those improvements. And I, this isn't just something that I think is unique to Silicon Valley today and things like Y Combinator, like we discussed earlier, but is also the reason why Britain becomes the kind of initial Silicon Valley in London in particular in the late 16th, early 17th centuries becomes the initial hub is because you have inventors kind of not just being inventive, but also using the proceeds of invention or even the proceeds of other things they're doing to then promote invention still further. And it's creating those institutions and those norms and that kind of culture of being pro-invention as well as being an inventor yourself, which I think are very two distinct things is the most important thing. So it's a sort of adopt the improving mentality and then actively try and pass it on. Great. Well. Anton, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on.